So welcome to the first um, little gallery art and poetry storytelling event. I am so happy to see all of these wonderful faces. Um, I would like to start by stating uh, that we are on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and uh, particularly with tomorrow being the National Day of rec Truth and Reconciliation, um, it's definitely a day to uh, reconciliate with uh, the lack of truth that is being um, basically known throughout uh, about the injustices mm -hmm. that continue to take place on these indigenous territories. Um, so that is something to, to continue to think about today and throughout not only just one single day uh, or one single uh, land acknowledgement. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, the bookshop as well um, as a continued, uh, as a continued queer um, and marginalized um, forward space, is is something that uh, is always important to um, keep in mind for the mandate of the space and um, what the sh what is done in the shop uh, and everything. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I would like to say welcome all. This is the first event at the uh, Cross and Crows Bookshops, the Little Gallery um, Art Show. Yes! Um, and so this event is, Aliza Boza is the um, visual artist. So there is um, the art here and here that is touchable, as is Aliza's um, love and amazing work uh, represents. Um, yeah, and I appreciate everyone being here and still masking up when there is times that, you know, can, people have been flip-flopping about that. Um, and another accessibility request that I have um, for tonight is that someone does have a electromagnetivity uh, sensitivity, so if you are able to turn either your phone off or turn it to like airplane mode um, if possible, um, that would be very helpful and very appreciated. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, uh, this is the first event um, of, of this, as I said, and the, the bookshop is only 10 weeks old. So um, thank you for being the, the uh, sort of guinea pigs for um, for uh, this uh, type of event and uh, yeah I, I haven't really introduced myself uh, I'm Taz, Taz Solis, uh, they them pronouns and um, yeah if you have any questions, feedback, would like to be a future poetry or um, storyteller or visual artist or anything um, reach out and be lovely to uh, have you present in future events. Uh, so yeah, um, I will start by reading. Um, so Jataka was one of the planned um, poets for tonight um, and is an amazing community organizer, um, but she unfortunately uh, has not been feeling well this week. So I will be one of a couple of stand-ins for um, tonight um, in her place. But she is also um, fundraising for a um, yoga retreat um, that is much needed um, for her. So it's actually, I just slightly put the jar over there and it, it will be moved around. Uh, it has a little rainbow flag uh, there. Um, it will be found later around. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yes. thank you for the, the wonderful, um, the, yes. Um, so yeah, if you would like to donate, there's also links for uh, like online, PayPal, um, and, all, and all that stuff. Um, but yes, if you are interested in donating to um, the uh, fundraiser that Jonica was planning on doing already with selling some of her art here, um, that would always be uh, lovely. 
Um, so I will just read um, Jataka's bio just for um, her sake. So uh, Jataka is a community organizer and expressive arts therapist. She organizes spaces for and with other queer, trans, and disabled folks of color. She is an interdisciplinary artist. Her art centers around disability justice, intergenerational trauma, and healing. Her experiences as a queer woman of, woman of color and grief processing and healing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, much love to Jotica. Yeah. <laughs> and I will, I have a couple of poems that I've planned for tonight. Um, a, a little small bio, but you'll see me at all these events, so if you want to find my bio at online, <laughs> you'll find it. Um, but um, I uh, published the scene back in 2018, I think, and it's a compilation of uh, including an archive of dig digging through some Tumblr poems and stuff like that. So some of them are like 2014, 2011, before kind of things. But I'll just uh, share a sampling for today um, for, for some of them. The struggle between the weight of survival and the yearning to flourish. May I stare at you longingly? May I venture across the city just to be in your presence? May we freeze time for a moment with our hugs? May I interlock my fingers into yours and feel the energy between our palms? May your hands linger on the edges between my arms and the rest of the universe? May we fold our bodies together and interlock in the warmth of our timid veins? May I breathe in the stories from your kind lungs. May I shyly ponder your eyes, hoping fear will melt away from us. May I rejoice in the sound of your sweet voice. May you explore the crevices of my mind to find trust in its folds. Mm -hmm. May I whisper to you in foreign sounds so that one day you will know them too. May our lips dance on each other's skin and electrify us both. May I do all of this, or none, as long as it makes your hours less burdensome. Mm. Through uncertainty and fright, may you know that I thrive on just one yes from you. Mm. From the boundless cosmos inside of you, it is an honor to explore but one speck of your solar dust. I hope I am given the opportunity to learn entire solar systems of your being, if you allow me to. You are intrigued by my consciousness, by my thoughts in four dimensions, by my cyber network of images I cannot extract from my skull. Words get trapped in my tongue, yet fly out on page. It is a structure many of us ponder in frustration. But in this space, I feel completed. I am full. I am witnessed. My words fit into the organized chaos of melodic prose. Our moments are a needle and thread. Hesitance guides my many stitches. Your steer tethers us. I learn, yearning without question, puncturing doubt with each stroke. You slide me from our non-linear presence, suspended in void until our seconds consolidate edges. Mm. Um, blinding, dis binding dispersed, thoughts into raw present repletion. Mm. Your ink in pages of my skin stains in ways mm. I begged for. Mm. A book left unopened for so long, growing brittle and dry without witness. Feeling new, yet cold, 
as titles changed around, yet dust remained firmly on my spine. Mm. Now, with every touch, I am alive. In every stroke, my story is uncovered. Mm. I am curved, quenched, saturated in glorious streaks and traces of adventure. Mm. Woo! Mm. Woo! And my last poem for tonight, also um, some kind of about why I personally enjoy poetry. <laughs> poetry. When my mind sees paragraphs of text and decides all of them are terms and service instructions, in a blink of my, my eyes, forget my glasses aren't on my head. My eye droop. My eyes droop with fatigue, overwhelmed by consumption of flat words. Mm. Poetry, found in scribbles on walls, mm. bouncing bulletins of brilliance, ephemeral snacks of textual loquaciousness, mm. replacing ads on the bus, notes nestled in the nooks and crevices, slim books slipping between seams of my consciousness, chap, zine, song, dream, Flow feeding senses, emotions sit strong, warm words dearly cupped in hands, stitched story spun, sticking like cotton candy. How novel, each cloud of words. Some clouds pass as quick as brief shade on warm days. Others carve shapes and shadows into the garden of our skin. When city letters scream, Slurry under sour halitosis, flash, claw under pupils. <sighs> Breathe, seek, hear a poem to ease. So some of these were excavated from uh, an old poetry zine that I'm thinking of maybe reprinting and bringing into the book shop into the bookshop. Mm -hmm. If anyone else has zines or chapbooks, I know that that's something that also the shop owner and mm -hmm. I know myself thoroughly appreciates zines and chapbooks. So bring them to the shop if you would like. <laughs> Woo! So now for our feature visual um, artist who is also a wonderful poet. Aliza is a queer, non-binary, Filipino, Italian artist who loves to build community through art. She uses a mixed medium art style, highlighting mesmerizing colors and textures, and she encourages people to touch her art pieces. Aliza's other interested interests include sorting and identifying microscopic seashell species, collecting cherry tree sap, finding bugs, looking at beautiful rocks, and observing the natural world. Aliza was a member of the Purple Thistle Collective before it shut down in 2016, where they sold art at the Vancouver Eastside Culture Crawl and facilitated art workshops for youth. Aliza started creating as a young child, attending Langley Fine Art School for 12 years, and currently studying visual art part-time at Langara College. They dream of eventually creating or joining an accessible art space in East Van. Aliza! Thank you for that introduction. Um, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Aliza, and I just want to say thank you for coming and viewing my art and appreciating and touching and just I'm very happy to be showing my art after so long um, mm. and <laughs> it just makes me very happy that people are appreciating it mm -hmm. um, and I'm really thankful for this space as well. So I'm going to share some poetry. Um, I haven't really figured out which poems I'm going to read yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, here I am. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to do the safe one that I, I have been working on for a while. This poem is called Bluebell Roots. 
We were walking around our school playground, where everything was slowly fading away. I wanted to hold onto the flowers you picked for me. I wanted to watch the oranges and lavenders fade to gray in my pocket, because I know I would forget them there for at least two days. Before remembering to put them in a book, where I would forget them there. <laughs> All of the townhouses look familiar, unremarkable. I am always reaching towards the leaves, the fallen ones, like red paint, peeled and torn. I am always dancing around cherry trees, looking for crystals I can see through. We are going to the beach after tomorrow. I am looking forward to that. Mm. But right now, we're in the park at school, and it's 3 a.m. We are listening to music that I don't care about. I am leaning against the middle slide, and I can't shake that feeling that you think you're wet when you're just cold. <laughs> At every bench we sat on, deconstructed like half gods, oh. cookies and milk. Mm -hmm. So we crumbled too, onto our backs mm -hmm. with sand and twigs and mud and feels. Mm -hmm. And when we broke up, I told myself I never needed to let go. Not ever. I could hold my feelings like air bubbles in my blood bloodstream. I could place our memories under my tongue, inside my sweaters, and in between the bluebell roots in the soil. Mm. On our drive to the beach, I was looking at the pine trees by the, all the houses and wondered if, if at Christmas time, which families had the time to decorate. You pointed out pine cones and how if you squint your eyes enough, some of them look like bees, and I laugh at you. Do you remember the first beach we stopped at? The long, leading rows of pebbles, soft sand, but rough rocks. The repetition in the waves. How the sun looked behind the water, sparkling the trash that lined the roadside ditches. Mm -hmm. I picked up a starfish, red-orange, a sea urchin the size of a bottle cap. Purple, red, and alive. I kept them warm in my hand and forgot that sea urchins can stink. The water rushed in as we walked away. How considerate of the waves to wait till we left to flood the pools of stagnant water just waiting for the tide. I told you I wanted to stay the night here. In the morning, I could walk along the edges of the low waves and look for shells, but we drove on. We got to a dense area with reaching green stems of salmon berries, but the waves were not considerate. I had flashbacks to holding onto the concrete, hoping the rip tides wouldn't pull too hard. But then again, if I drowned, I wouldn't have to go back to school. <laughs> Tomorrow is Monday, and I didn't drown. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this one is one I have not shared before. Oh. Um, <laughs> so let's let's try this. <laughs> Mixtapes on repeat, your beats against my neck, my heart opens and closes like a seashell. Indescribable defeat, the impulse of speaking vinegar and sweat, and wanting my words back. Mm. This crush has gotten me thrown into the lake by nervous laughter. Even the fish are well aware that I just want to spend time with you. <laughs> I just want to feel close to you. So sink into me, play music into my ears, and bring my fingertips closer to you. We're so far from the ocean that I'm thirsty for salt and sand and your skin between my teeth. I'm breathing beats into the air, like chamomile smoke and peppermint leaves. Nervously, I ask you questions like, do you even like me? And it comes out like broken glass, low to the ground, sweet teeth, sharp but not reflective of how I actually feel. Because I feel lost, repetition, I'd like to put my feet on the ground, I'd like to feel not so far away from the ocean. Mm. Mm. So, 
Um, in 2015, I was living in a collective house that was supposed to be like a stable space for me. Um, and then Dan Mangan bought it. Oh. And was like really awful about it. So this poem is about housing insecurity, and I haven't actually shared this poem with anyone. Oh. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah. Content warning for housing insecurity, of course. Hmm. This is where I remember living in my thoughts. Eight years ago, red painted hallways, deep blue bedroom, my bed is flat against the window and my back is against the next door neighbor's kitchen. Watching, walking up and down the streets pretending like nothing's changing. The seasons are stagnant. The winter was defrosted. The summer flooded. I was almost ready to fall off the edge of buildings built too high but made not safe enough for anyone to live in. I'd like to point out that it's not the first time that I've been unrooted. Bins of unpacked clothes marked pants, shirts, sweaters, and hints of sage and rosemary in the air of my cold bedroom. We were living under stairways. That's how it felt, high in the air and not how you'd like it, low into the basements of dirt and moss and mold. And the heat rose too fast, not enough time to grab onto warmth and life and connection. I didn't hold out because I was frightened by the unknown pitter-patter of lost addresses I never bothered to remember anyways. And people telling me that I shouldn't be scared. Why should I? They told me I could, I could jump higher than I could. If only I could chew in one piece, like one bite fills my stomach, like one bite should fill my stomach of cement and drywall, pink insulation, dinner plates, and not having a dry place to land was just inevitable, like dust on untouched appliances and broken space heaters. I was told my existence, my body, shouldn't stay in one place, even if it hurts to physically move, encouraged to step, to step forward, only to be shoved back into the familiar darkness false presumptions, artificial lights, and dry blood clean. I was told to stay still, reaching out for hands in the dirt, when all I could see was clovers, mechanically broken stones, mixed with twisted herbs polluted by busy streets sheltering bread eating birds. I was told to stay still, and move when held by neck, speak when spoken to, eat with mouth shut, Grab only what's given. I was told that we didn't deserve a home. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm gonna do um, a happy one. <laughs> <laughs> you write those? <laughs> <laughs> Not usually. <laughs> Um, so this, this poem is about my grandmother, um, and it holds a lot of memories for me of being in the Philippines and being a child and just running barefoot and climbing mango trees and just, you know, having a fun time. <clears throat> I am 14th of 16 grandchildren. Warmth all around me. I'm sitting down with the smell of vetiver in my mouth, whispers of baby chickens, pecking at grains of corn. The feeling of tires over patches of warm, warm rice laid on cement. She whistles in the morning, 4 a.m. She throws more corn at the chickens, and I haven't even slept yet. We're both awake. I've been reading a book for hours, lying eyes open till the first peak of light blue hits the earth like a sandstorm. Like a rainstorm, actually. <laughs> I'm aware of how her fingernails feel. I promise myself that the next time I hold her hand, I will clutch all of her stories into me. Mm. Mm. What 
Okay. Um, I think that that's all I'm going to share today. Thank you. Thank you. vegetarian master chef. <laughs> his work touches on his real-life experiences of being queer and disabled in a chaotic world. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> so, a little disclaimer, I'm more a musician than a poet most of the time. They don't really have a guitar to hide behind, so yeah. this is very new for me, so bear with me if Woo! I Woo! stumble over my words or whatever. Guitar, guitar. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Eric is from Sometimes my brain feels like hundreds of ping pong balls set loose in a bouncy castle. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts scatter about in every direction, some directions I didn't know existed, <laughs> in an unending cycle of chaos. Yeah. And sometimes my brain feels like mashed potatoes. Uh -huh. Dull, subdued, the sort made in dusty kitchens and dusty houses by dusty people. <laughs> but mostly, my brain feels like a poem, scrawled oh. on the back of a coffee-stained cafeteria napkin. There's a chance I'm brilliant, and an even greater chance I'll be crumpled up and tossed in the trash. Uh. How many great poems and minds have met this week? Uh. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Um, I thought I would open with a, you know, a more epic one, but uh, this one is... Um, about the death of an estranged parent. Uh, and it's, so it's a little heavy. But, uh, uh, it's important for me, I think, to share it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I never meant for it to be forever when I hung up that phone, in hurt, in confusion, in fear. I always saw my goodbyes as see you later, even when I was angry. But when my hurt stretched the wingspan of 11 years of trying to fly away, you fell at my feet, and I was not ready to fall at yours in time. So I stood back, watching death's wings unfurled horizon take you, forever. I questioned the grief, so strange, not linear. So long I felt it even before you were gone. But I never meant for it to be forever. I never meant for the wild, untamable future to soar over my body without you beside me. Eleven years of never landing on a solid ledge, when I could have, perhaps, Found your olive branch, seen the rainbow above us, before forever came for you. Because I never meant for it to be forever, and I don't ever know that. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Got that one out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have three that are all about time. I find time, just the concept of time, very fascinating. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read them kind of one after the other. Um, I am a drop of infinite water in a trembling sea, each wave a spiral dance, turning, reclaiming a hope that once was. I am abundance. I am light. I am. May my madness burst forth into dancing, May my sorrow erupt into laughter. May my joy spread like rain over a parched meadow, giving life to the impatient wildflowers we are. Rich, bright, vital, as plentiful in, as grains of sand in the infinite hourglass of eternity. Mm. It's been seven months. A crisp October leaf drifts slowly down, landing in a crevice. A wrinkle on time's knowing forehead. Soft, her crow's wing eyes flutter open, 
You step on the leaf and pleading ask her, how much longer? Mm. Mm. Spring is when the creatures of time claw their way from winter's depths onto sunny shores, shake off the hourglass sand and take refuge under warm forever blossoms. Oh. That's how I imagine, anyway, the turning of seasons. A desperate last struggle out of a darkness which engulfs everything. The determination not to drown, to live just a little longer. Knowing that, predictably, the wheel will continue spinning. Spring will come, and when it does, it will bring its light and warmth. A receiving blanket for my birth. Wow. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm trying to decide. I have so many, and I'm trying to decide which ones I want to share. Um, I want to. This is a short one, and it's about a hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are my home. In many ways, you still are. Wherever I went, I carried you in my pocket, figuratively, sometimes literally. You were my light when I felt small and prickly, like you. Aww. If you could be so small and so scared and still learn to trust, Aww. maybe then so can I. <laughs> okay, I think I'll do two more. This one is dedicated to my dear Lisa. One of my dearest friends, and um, yeah, that's what I'll be, I'll be <laughs> um, I vow to always grate the potatoes when we make latkes and your hands are swollen and tender and tired from wear. If you vow to help me stir the risotto. And I vow to phone you in five minute intervals until you wake for important commitments <laughs> or talk with you late into the night about fears or about lemons, because I know you'd do the same for me. I vow to listen to you gush about the things you love, something I love, Aww. be it rainbows or snails, eggs or cherry tree sap or dreams, or the ins and outs of intersections and privilege, Aww. or your family far and near. If you vow to always get excited, because your smile is my beacon in the dark and the home to which it leads. Never lose your spark, for better or worse, in sickness, because we're both crippled and crazy and beautiful and divine. <laughs> We are gods together, equal and opposite reactions to the problems of the world. I vow to save the world alongside you, one cup of tea at a time, because we are a team. I vow to love you, us, in our perfect imperfection. I vow to be the best friend I can be, for you, for always, till fate do us part. I've got one more. Um, I wrote it during Pride this year, so um, it's a little bit uh, of a call to action. <laughs> to the she's and he's and they. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna start that one again. <laughs> to the she's and he's and they's. To the it's so subversive, the misfits who never saw themselves in stories. To the fairy tale princess with their dragon of dysphoria. This double incision Prince Charming doesn't mind your fiery breath. No taming necessary. <laughs> Keep your flames as a beacon to the next generation of storytellers so they might fight so they might change the script, to include the voices we never heard, to extend a hand to those left behind. Happily ever after can be ours. We just have to fight harder for it. Uh -huh. Our story doesn't need to be tragic. Our voices are shaking, but so full of magic. a 15 minute break for if anyone needs to <laughs> go to the washroom, grab some air, stretching, read a book. <laughs> so uh, also Oliver um, would like to yes I will come in a moment and forgot to mention that I have an album. <laughs> yeah. It's my baby. And oh, each wow. song on the album is recorded at a different point during my voice change in my voice. Wow! Oh, my God. I have copies for sale, sliding scale, kind of whatever you can pay, honestly. I just want people to hear it. So. Oh! It's super cool, everyone. Also on Spotify. 
Yeah, we yeah. saw the screening platforms as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 And also, just a reminder, if, if not everyone has heard, um, that Jataka, who was one of the, um, was going to be a performer but couldn't make it tonight, um, has, we're uh, fundraising because she's going to, um, she's fundraising for a yoga retreat that she was, is going to attend. So um, I moved the jar. It has a little rainbow flag over there. If you have, want any cash donations uh, over there, there's also um, links to her socials, uh, to like PayPal, um, all of that kind of stuff. Let me know if you would like that as well. Uh, so yeah. Now we are on to our next um, kind of last minute <laughs> edition performer. Um, Aliza suggested um, Harper for uh, some poetry, um, who's um, out, from out of town. Uh, so um, I have no, no other bio um, for Harper. So yeah, Harper. <laughs> Gosh, there's so many people. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> if I take off my glasses, I can't perceive all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes! And, and, and yeah, and you can't perceive me either, right? Wait, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Where are you going? <laughs> yeah. So, my name is Harper Robinson. I am a writer. Poetry is my first love. I am currently working on my very first novel, so Ooh, one day it will be published. Hello. Um, and I, I guess I will share some writing with y'all. <laughs> By the way, I'm not from like the South. Just, just in case. But okay. y'all is really great and <laughs> gender neutral and Woo. Yeah. all of that. Yeah. A lot of my writing deals with, um, just as content warning, a lot of death, grief, all of that, so please take care of yourselves. I will never be offended if someone gets up and leaves like, oh no, they didn't like my writing. No. Yeah. No. Take care of yourselves first and foremost, because that's always important. <sighs> oh my gosh, writing, what? <laughs> so, this first poem. All of them are named. Um, you might end up seeing at the beginning of the book that I'm writing. It's very short, not very sweet, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's called Exit, Exit Strategies. <sighs> you once asked me where your Achilles heel was, and I hesitated before pointing my long, bony finger towards your chest, afraid you might use the dull marmalade knife to, take, to carve out your own heart. If you had done that, I think every time we shared tea, I would taste only orange-flavored you over unseasonably warm afternoons. Too sweet and too ripe, not nearly enough pulp, and still too much. Mm. Mm. Medusa's daughter, how to break a god. When Perseus pillaged your temple, he did not see the babe. She was wrapped in blue, smeared with cobalt, and her coiled hair was secured by Indian silk. He swung his steel, which laid two heavy and two boyish hands, adorned and blessed by gods, and promptly took your head as verified proof that monsters must exist. The blood spatter analyst gave validity to all that Perseus boasted, a squirt here, another there, streaks of an arterial black that gave way to night and dyed every fiber of the only linens I wore. I cried for years, century, millennia in the wake of your death, an eager young thing that looked too much like her mother, and fretted over the mere thought of turning people to stone. You see, I was born out of wedlock. Conceived in a church, or maybe on the rocks, some god's six swimmers traveling a forbidden path up a shallow brook like salmon striving impossibly upstream. I was born anyway. A scarlet, startling thing, born broken with tiny, unflappable wings. And I'm now of servitude to the gods who cursed your name. These boy gods who dick around and squint their eyes away because looking at you is like looking into the fucking sun. 
For now I let Perseus ride me safe in the saddle. I play the broken in wet colt, your skull still hanging like a gun in his satchel. But I wait. I play Saturn's long game until he slacks the reins on this equine. In his stupefaction, I take your busy snakes into my mall. And I announce that I have always known where I come from. <laughs> How's everyone feeling? Me too. Because this one's so not uplifting. Good. <laughs> it's called Inside Jokes. And I've never read it in public. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for being all my guinea pigs, by the way. <laughs> oh, always. Yes. Happy to be so. I will always be your yes. guinea pig, Harper. <laughs> Thank my mother cracked the world when she came into it. A smile across her face like porcelain, a disquieting human made from ashes and dust, spilling milkshakes and forming laugh lines. Her smile shattered when she made me from porcelain, bleeding and crying, analyzing and discarding, spilling sour milk and pressing cream to her laugh lines, abhorring how those marks adorned her face. He was bleeding and crying, she was analyzing and discarding, an instruction manual for how she fought with my father, trying to expunge those marks that adorned her face, badges and bottle caps that proved that she had gotten this far. This was how she fought with my father, wrapping her arms around me and banshee screeching, throwing bottle caps and screaming that she had gotten this far, running out into the middle of the road without clothes. Mm -hmm. Wrapping her arms around me, she'd shriek like a banshee. I'd curl up in the hallway, holding myself, rocking, as she ran out into the middle of the road without her mind. The creature fraying at its ends and singing about coming undone. I'd curl up in the hallway, rocking myself like she used to. Remember, babies don't crack like porcelain when you drop them. We are delicate creatures writing the book on how we have come undone, looking inside each other's ribs to see if we can live there. Remember, I don't crack like porcelain when you drop me. Mm. All I've ever wanted is someone to split me open and push my organs aside and say that they could live there. Mm. Together, we could laugh like our traumas or punchlines. <laughs> All I've ever wanted was for her to split me open. Tell me I'm fine. It's all right. You were tender. You did well. Together, we could laugh at the trauma inside jokes of our own design. Bruises and bottle caps that let us know that we're alive. Mm. Tell me she's fine. It's all right. She was tender. She tried to be well. My mother cracked the world when she left it. Her headstone, a bottle cap that told the world that she was alive. A disquieting human made ashes, made dust. Mm. Thank you all. This one's much more uplifting. I think we're ready for that, right? Goodness <laughs> gracious. It's called Mondays. <laughs> I actually love Mondays quite a bit. It's new. We get to experience a new week. It's new potential. Anyway, Mondays. Mondays, Garfunkel side. But I woke up wishing today, wishing every day felt as quiet and fresh and new as this. The sun has only just begun to touch my horizons, color smearing itself with chubby, tiny fingers. I feel God. This is Genesis, a short gap between an outstretched arm and a spark glimmering small and white, flickering just half a beat away from touch. Its vestige is ephemeral, a relic to dig up on a Sunday when I can't stand the thought of praying for more weekend. My bones are tired, I can't sit up straight or remember the last time I slept. This epic, endless, doesn't fall far from grief, for there are things I wasted away the hours without consuming, and even more that I intended to do. But today, 
Today is a crisp apple, and I've already brushed my teeth to feel the way these calcified lumps just sink into sharp and sweet flesh. Mondays, rough uncle side. But creation began on a Monday. My tongue was made ancient and thick honey on a Monday. Michelangelo painted on a Monday. I was born on a Monday. Mm. And my last poem, which I have called Conscription, and I also have not read out loud before. When someone you love dies, you'll pick up pieces of them from this dimension and the world next door. You dreamed about scrambled eggs and laying centerpieces and their fingers kissing the nape of your neck as they drew the razor down your throat, your thigh, your undercarriage, your shins, hair sheared by their kindness, a serrated blade that knows your skin too well. Maybe it's that you built calluses knowing their sharp tongue like it belonged in your own mouth. Whether you were born with one that matched them or adapted to the taste, how their teeth clinked against yours, radiating pain through your gums like they could break through the plaque. When someone you love dies, every piece of them is shattered like a vase, crashing, shattering, fracturing. There was life before love devastated you like a disease. Remember, you wanted this. You don't get this without the car crash, leaving you broken and needing a metal rod that holds your leg together. Where's the goddamn rod for the sign that claims that we were here? We are all shrapnel, a war made blazing flesh and weakened bone, a bed begging for a missing body. When someone you love dies, it's a violent crime that murders, robs you of the things you gave away freely things you forgot were no longer yours. Bodies are always dying from the inside out, devastated by illnesses, pinned on race, religion, and sexuality. Sometimes we're still stupefied, still grasping for luggage lost mid-flight, rapid hymns from feral mouths. Hiroshima has nothing on loss. This just expedited passport. Mm. We have always done this to ourselves. Mm. I hope we always do. Mm. I would reduce myself to nothing if it meant loving you again and again. Memories are children you made, something calcined in your subconscious that one day will be forgotten. But we, my love, we were once here living sparks in our eternities. Mm. Woo! Presenter for tonight is on sheep. And also, before uh, this uh, pre announcement, um, that the next one of these will be uh, Thursday, October 12th, um, 7 to 9 as well. Um, and again, for future ones, um, find on our socials of Cross and Crows books as well as my own socials and uh, various performers will probably as well. I'm yeah. going to be that one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Santiago, another person who is also going to be in it. So yeah, it's uh, going to be a little spookier next. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yeah. And if again you're interested for uh, future visual arts or for um, performing like these lovely people, um, you can get in touch with me and um, we can make it happen for future months. <laughs> so On, On Sheep is a multidisciplinary dabbler in the ephemeral arts, a clown, a witch, a performer, as often for tiny audiences as for larger ones. Yee. The written work focuses on lineage, queer affinities, small magics, and the daily textures of their situated experience. You can find them occasionally and frequently on their uh, 
well, links links in, in the bio of <laughs> the event pages. Um, but yeah, you can find them there. So thank Woo. you. <laughs> Woo. I'm on co-host at cohost.org slash oh, yes. with <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone else is using that one, but oh, it's the one I'm in on. Um, I have two pieces. One of them is extremely short. It's kind of like a warm-up. And then the other one is about 15 minutes long. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's experimental. <laughs> 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 um, so my first one is uh, called um, A Short True Story About Fungus. <laughs> Um, I was about to make coffee the other day when I saw a strange object on the kitchen bookshelf. A plastic zip-top freezer bag nestled in a little dip formed by the Veganomicon and the Visual Food Encyclopedia, which at first glance I thought contained a fancy cashew cheese that definitely should not be at room temperature, <laughs> but which on second glance actually appeared to contain an extremely moldy block of tofu. <laughs> but. On closer inspection, I definitely saw seeds in there, and it felt spongy, kind of like really nice, fresh tempeh, and I realized this was a mycelium on a substrate. It was not garbage, it was a project. Probably not in the best shape being stored in a plastic bag on the shelf, but still, maybe salvageable if it got to its log or grow bin or whatever pretty soon. I don't know very much about mushroom cultivation, but I knew one of my housemates was talking about it recently, so I figured it was probably a project they were working on. <laughs> so, I sent a photo to everyone with the caption, Friends! This was on top of the cookbooks, and I briefly thought it was a very moldy tofu, but upon closer examination it seems possible that this is a living organism in reasonable health. Can anyone confirm? One by one. Each of my housemates confirmed, in fact, that the opposite was true. Uh, no one knew what it was, and no one knew how it got there, and I slowly, vertiginously came to realize that while this certainly was a mycelium on a substrate, that substrate appeared to be tofu, and the <laughs> fungus appeared to be unintentional. <laughs> we collectively decided that this being who came to us fully formed from nowhere on its own power, or at least remained unnoticed until it was good and ready to be perceived, should be revered as that day's small household god. <laughs> the thing I find delightful about this is that I imagine many people live in such a way that it would be immediately obvious when someone in their household had left a block of tofu marinating at room temperature for several weeks. And while that was also immediately obvious to me, I have just enough context to know that sometimes things that look like funky garbage are in fact cherished futures being tended. Yes! Woo. Even if they do sometimes turn out to be funky garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, once something's become a god, it feels a bit rude to just put it in the garbage, so we're all hoping the divinity fades soon. <laughs> Thank you. Woo. Woo. Okay, and then the second one, which is longer and weirder, is called Desperate and Beautiful and Absurd. Um, and I'm going to give you a content note about it. Um, overall, pretty light tone. Themes of spiritual and emotional healing, endurance sports, reflections on drug use, a brief, very brief, saucy moment with a mention of sex and light kink, and uh, experience of poverty, aimlessness in adulthood, queer community, and theme parks. <laughs> All right. It's three weeks before the Half Iron Triathlon, and we've been riding our bikes for the past four hours. It's our first time riding the ambitious course for this ambitious race. Just about 45 kilometers, ever so slightly uphill for the most part, with a few spots that are dramatically uphill, and then turn around and go all the way back down, ever so slightly downhill, with a few spots where a bike pushing on speed is at a real risk of breaking the speed limit for cars. At about the 75th kilometer of the 90 kilometer ride, as cars driving shorter distances than we've biked are passing us, I've begun to truly internalize that we're really doing this. The training has paid off, and even though this is hard, I'm going to be able to go hard enough on the race day to do it. At about the 75th kilometer of the 90 kilometer ride, I begin to imagine the 90th kilometer. I imagine pulling into where we've parked the car for the day, 
right next to the Cultus Lake Adventure Park, the lesser of the two ticketed attractions in that resort municipality, where families will be returning to their cars after someone got sick on the spinning pirate ship, or just after everyone has exhausted the possibilities of a theme park half the size of its parking lot. <laughs> I imagine our return to this parking lot. And I imagine looking at these people having their totally normal end of summer day, and I imagine them looking at us, two cyclists, returning to their parked car. So many places those cyclists could be coming from that are so much more likely than that other lake 45 kilometers away, gently uphill with its own smaller parking lot. We are preparing to do such an unlikely feat of physical endurance, but we're parked next to a tiny theme park on one of the last few weekends of summer. Two cyclists coming back to their car, how would they know? How could they even imagine that we had just done something so desperate and beautiful and absurd? Of course, I'm susceptible to this feeling. Mm -hmm. Prone to wandering public spaces, thinking about how no one knows about my special little secret. <laughs> a little bit tragic and a little bit superior. Like me and my secret cadre of people have access to a plane of reality so many others just don't. Mm -hmm. And maybe a little bit. Like, we're the only ones truly living. Our glances laden with seeing set apart from the rest of the world, and it almost feels like we could raise our hands and stop time. Walk around the diorama of the normal, have a conversation with everything paused, drop hands, and everyone starts moving around again, none the wiser, but restraining ourselves from exercising our true power, a glance, a quiet smile, a moment of eye contact in the supermarket. This is a romantic little affect I adopted wholeheartedly from a poem I read once. <laughs> this is going to sound a bit intense for a minute, but hopefully not in the way you think. Stick with me. I used to be, like, really into drugs. Kind of in a weird way. I remember going to dinner with some people I hadn't seen in a few years and realizing that not everyone I used to know in college had been on a multi-year psychonautic exploration of the experiential textures of various chemical alterances. I had become unrelatable. It was through a series of interactions like that dinner that I learned to mostly keep quiet about the drugs I was doing in my leisure time because it was alienating and kind of upsetting to people who weren't my drugs friends. But I desperately wanted to map out that confusing spiritual, mental, ontological space and to learn how to have overwhelming experiences and integrate them safely. I was kind of a mess, you know? Mm -hmm. Trying to sort out how to be in right relationship with everything and build a queer life on my own terms, with my own chosen family, with my values. Wrestling with the big shit, gender and class, and working to unspell the whiteness and colonialism that are the inheritances of my settler lineages, and doing my best not to come to the conclusion that the best way forward was to erase myself completely. A song I was listening to a lot back then contains the line, I have gotten into some terrible trouble beneath your blank and rinsing gaze, and I don't think it's talking about whiteness, but you know, you, feel, you find the lines you need sometimes. I recently found a piece I had completely forgotten writing that reflects on this period of time, which I'm going to read to you now, and then we'll come back to this in a minute. The poem is called A List. One. It's not like this. A sudden switch and you've unlocked your higher self. Rather, a slow untangling of force and influence. Two. At some point in the whole mess, I greedy grabbed too many spools and they spilled all over the floor, rolling everywhere, very beautiful, the kind of mess it's pretty fun to roll around in. Throw up in the air, gleefully tangle and snap, and hey, tie me up with this and fuck me. But then somebody said, by the way, that's the stuff you're supposed to build a life with. Have you seen mine? It is a beautiful tapestry, crafted by rare artisans. Three. So, you start untangling. But there's capitalism in the city, and whoops, you're an adult now, so you're dragging around this tangled mess of threads with you everywhere, and sometimes they get tangled in other people's threads who also haven't figured out their work yet, and I guess now the two of you are dancing, huh? Four. One day, 
you figure out that not everyone has a very beautiful tapestry life that folds up nicely, but a lot of people have definitely figured out how to put away their threads, and this lets them move around the city without getting caught on anything. So, you use some of your thread to make a little bag, and you shove the rest of it inside, and now you're walking around the city and doing things, and eventually you're not having to choose between rent and food, and that's pretty good. <laughs> Five. When I say you, I'm actually talking about myself. You know how it is. <laughs> Six. When I have some time to myself sometimes, I open the bag and try to work through some of the tangle in there. I lay out different colored threads in my living room and carefully separate them from each other onto their own little spools. It really feels like someday I will start on the weaving. Oh. Seven. Sometimes we do this together, my friends and I. And sometimes the crisscrossing threads look like they're forming the beautiful thing we will all make together. And sometimes this just makes more tangles. Eight, think too hard about it and maybe you get caught up resenting the errant threads of people you don't know anymore and how they got snarled up inextricably into your whole thing, but personally, I have to admit that some of them made my little mess a whole lot more beautiful. Nine. It is years later, and I catch myself attempting to compose poems that are really just lists of boys I fucked or times I almost died. Like, if I could catch the right thread through the whole thing, I might end up saying something really powerful about life. So anyway, as I say, I used to be really into drugs in a way that was honestly pretty unrelatable, but now I just do triathlons, which is basically the same skill set and takes up the same amount of time and makes it equally hard to talk to normal people about what I'm doing with my weekend. <laughs> Actually, while I'm on the subject of poems I wrote one time, there's one more I want to read you that I think is relevant, and before I read it, I'm going to give you some context. This is from 2016, when there was a website called Twitter, and there were a bunch of trans people on Twitter participating in a fun little thing called a hashtag, and this particular trendy one was called Egg Mode, and it was full of trans people talking about examples of how their pre-transition selves had particular qualities or behaviors that, in hindsight, were manifestations of denial or repression, and the tone was overall pretty light and fun and gentle, loving, poking fun at the sort of cringy stuff your past self might have done, <laughs> that now seems like an obvious indication that you had not yet developed into the person you are today. And it was really nice. And uh, some themes started to emerge, and then out of those themes, there was this thing that was happening where people started talking about cracking eggs, like getting people who you think are trans to realize that they <laughs> are trans uh, because you think they have qualities that are kind of egg mode-ish, and that sort of felt less good to me. Because it's one thing to call your former self an unhatched egg when you were right there experiencing it, and it's so, so much different to say that about someone else whose experience you are not having, oh my goodness, and there's so much room for projection to creep in about what someone else's internal experience of the world might be and what is good for them, and then I started to think about what if actually we're all always transforming into new forms, and of course that is a very desperate and beautiful and absurd endeavor, and what all that did to the egg metaphor in any way, this is called egg mode. <laughs> <laughs> We're so many people this life. The unfathomable edge of the possible, so often just a border uncrossed, boundary unbroken, thin shell, ward and curse. It knows when this is no longer home. What song calls the hatchling to dream of cracking, to find a weak spot and enough life to get someplace so new? How every new someplace has its unfathomable edges, which curious creatures are cursed ever to hurl ourselves toward, where all this yearning carries us hurt, we are learning to ward. When a fresh creature emerges, it is fragile and raw, exhausted from the task and in need of a safe place to start. So, a half-iron triathlon is a foolish thing for a human to do. Mm -hmm. Because it consists of a 1900 meter swim followed by a 90 kilometer bike ride followed by a 21 kilometer half marathon run and it took me 7 hours and 17 minutes to do one recently and that's a really long time to do anything. 
And <laughs> training for one is just a huge psychological game as much as it is a physical one. And like any giant improbable endeavor, there are so many things about it that could be amazing metaphors for other things. And I'm not going to tell you about any of those other things because the one we are focusing on right now is that the training takes a lot of time during which you are doing increasingly absurd things, and it's hard to explain any of those to any of your non-triathlete friends, and as recently as four weeks before the race, I really wasn't sure if I was be going to be able to bike fast enough to make it 45 kilometers ever so slightly uphill, for the most part, with a few spots that were dramatically uphill, and then all the way back down. So, three weeks before the race, my partner and I went out and parked next to the tiny theme park and rode the route. The way up was hard. Harder than either of us expected. I kept saying, we can't give up on this whole thing until we've gotten to the top, and we see how much easier it is going to be to come down. But if I'm being honest, I didn't really believe it until we got to the top, and I felt how much easier it was going to be to come down. And so, at about the 75th kilometer of the 90 kilometer ride, when I'd begun to truly internalize the fact that we're really doing this, I began to imagine the 90th kilometer. I imagined pulling into the parking lot full of people having a totally normal end of summer day, and I imagined them looking at us, and I thought, no one is going to know that we've done something so desperate <laughs> and beautiful and absurd. How could they? Wow. Then you know what? We got to the parking lot, and I'm pretty sure no one knew we had just ridden what is definitely a foolish distance to ride a bicycle, but I saw a whole crew of children leaving the tiny theme park, supervised by a single adult. Does everyone have their snacks? Water? Pass him that bar! Watch that juice! And I thought, I have no idea what it's like to go to this theme park. <laughs> <laughs> holding space for us, literally, in this <laughs> uh, workshop. Um, and yeah, thanks again to Eliza and to this art, if like anyone else would like to um, see the art and has not, is not here right now, um, this will be up until the next event in October. Oh. Um, so feel free to um, invite other people to uh, come and um, mm -hmm. peruse and touch and experience. Uh, and again, thank you to Oliver and Harper and on. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing y'all at the next event. Yeah.